as part of our continued efforts to reach the African and other ethnic communities in the United Kingdom with greater impacts and create the platform to hear your silent and unheard views in this hugely green community in the United Kingdom, our channel, Ben TV, presents to you another live current affairs television program. Our focus on the program is to review and discuss issues around the diaspora community in the UK. The program offers you that unrestricted voice on issues affecting you in the UK. Join us live every Monday at 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Another business segment of Dialogue in Diaspora, 2 to 3 p.m. every Monday. But guess what? You know you can be part of the program. Just send us an email at bentelevisionuk at gmail.com. Dialogue in Diaspora, your voice, your opinion on our TV. Thank you for being part of the program today. And the program is voice coming to you from the intervention. My name is Tony Alabi. It's a pleasure to know that you're there today. It's been a very long year for us on this program. We've been taking a look at different immigration laws. Um, not only immigration, we've looked at different laws. Uh, we've looked at property law, we've looked at immigration law, we've looked at marriage law, we've looked at investment law, and even just recently, um, the uh, basic is of the based here in the United Kingdom in partnership with Africa Partnership in the UK uh, as part of their celebration for the 10th uh, year existence in practicing uh, in this country. They had a very well attended program at the London Stock Exchange where um, the firm uh, was looking at laws surrounding uh, investment and of course uh, uh, doing business in Africa. So it's been a very wonderful uh, year 2015 with Obasi Kisim here and it's been a pleasure that we've been able to forge this very wonderful partnership to bring education and information to you our viewers at home. And we do believe that you've had a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of information passed to you for this beautiful uh, program uh, from Ben Television. Once again, my name is Tony Alabi. As we come down, we'll be taking a look at um, uh, different changes in immigration laws and in 2015 and what we will be looking at what we'll be expecting in 2016. Uh, of course we do understand that in this country law changes um, well the, the way they come and this government has been uh, very desperate and serious about reducing uh, um, migration uh, from its thousands to just its uh, hundreds of thousands to just these tens of thousands and so a whole lot of changes have actually happened in that immigration law. Let's quickly take a review of what has happened in 2015 as we look into 2016. Sit back and enjoy the program. Joining me on the show today is our regular guest Jennifer Obaseki. Jennifer Obaseki is a senior partner at Obaseki Solicitors based here in the United Kingdom. Jennifer, thank you for being part of the program today. My pleasure. How, how would you look at 2000? Fifteen in terms of um, immigration matters and the law. It's been a very busy year, right from the impact of the interpretation of bad character reference, which has been extended, even though the law came in in 2014 in December, the impact has really been seen this year, 2015, even though they interpreted the, um, or they extended the requirement for the B1 English, people were not prepared for the interpretation of bad character to include periods that have been spent undocumented and working, or periods being spent undocumented and supporting yourself where the Secretary of State feels that you've not shown a sufficient level of independence and acting in accordance with the immigration rules. That being in breach of the rules alone has been now Fall, well, falls into the uh, definition of bad character. So where people have been granted their indefinite leave to remain, seen to be of good character, but going on to apply for naturalisation after paying that large sum of money, being defined as being of bad character because of the period they may have spent undocumented. That's been seen as a bit harsh. But the good thing with regards to naturalisation, A, we've seen that a lot of people who have been granted indefinite leave to remain, their children, so far as they're here in the United Kingdom and resident with them, are now able to apply for naturalisation without having spent the 10 years in the UK. So. Under the discretionary rules, it's always been the case that children, after spending 10 years in the UK, or even if they've been brought in, not necessarily born in the UK, after spending 10 years can apply for naturalisation. However, now if a parent has 
indefinitely to remain, any of their children can apply to be recognised as having the right to naturalise as a British citizen. Because it's accepted that those children will not be leaving the UK because their parents have been settled. Also, it's accepted that those children shouldn't be forced to continue to apply to regularise themselves or apply for an extension on their leave to remain time and time over because they are going to be here permanently in line with their parents. There have been other changes as we recognise again, you know, with the um, EEA dependents, it's important to acknowledge that the interpretation now, when you're going for your settlement, is going to be done in a strict accordance with EEA regulations. So your EEA sponsor will be looked upon to see whether they are exercising treaty rights. It will be looked upon to show that you're still in a relationship. And as we know, EA um, people are usually quite transient, so they move around a lot. So if your partner, sponsor, spouse is no longer present, it's important, very important, that if you don't have sufficient documentation to show they were exercising their treaty rights, that you try to look for an alternative means to extend your stay. Or if you have enough evidence to show that they worked for three years, that you may have to accept that you will only be able to apply for a retained rights of residence, which means that you will in time be able to apply for your settlement, but you might not be able upon the expiration of your five years. Because they are down looking quite um, stringently to see that your EEA sponsor is, ha is exercising their treaty rights, have, has been in a relationship with yourself, if you are the dependent. And so this is quite um, important. It's also been very clear that um, people who have been granted conditions on their leave to remain can also quite easily ch apply to change the conditions on their leave to remain. However, there's been a series of cases that have better outlined when that should be done. So it has to be done when there's a risk of homelessness or where you can't meet your, um, let's say, your living costs. So where your cost of living is extremely uh, burdensome, at risk of harming yourself, at risk of making you and any dependent children suffer, then you have to make the application for a change of, of your conditions um, to remain in the country. The form is actually free, so you can download that. We've provided the um, email address in previous programmes, but we've, as we've always said, if anybody needs help getting that form, then they should please feel free to contact us or their local law centre or solicitors to try and get assistance with getting the form and completing it. But you can get it on the .gov website. So if you are struggling to meet your living costs, if you are facing homelessness and you have a no recourse to public funds on your leave to remain as a condition, please don't suffer in silence. Apply to have the condition changed so that you are eligible to receive help and assistance and have it removed. It does take about four or more weeks, a minimum of four. I haven't seen it done faster than that. Um, you know, it's quite important, again, that we, we try to stress that before you make an application, make sure that you are eligible for the criteria you're applying in. The forms have changed again in November and December. The forms for settlement and um, discretionary leave to remain have changed. And the EA application forms, there's one major form now that's used and it's well over 50 pages long so again you must sit down and what they've said about that particular form is that even though not every page applies to you you should fill out the sections you feel do and it's obviously very difficult for many people to ascertain what pages they should fill and what pages they should not if you're in difficulty please please feel free to contact us we have a free clinic on friday mornings however Forms such as the naturalisation form haven't changed that much and you can go to your local authority to do their check and send service, which is quite cheap. It's under £100. And as I always say to people, if you're not sure, you can always phone the Home Office. However, the Home Office will always say we're not legally trained to advise. Um, you can actually email them. Sometimes the caseworkers get it wrong. So they go through your circumstance as you put it to them but at times they can get it wrong some are trained to an extent but can they advise you on how to put forward your discretionary application can they tell you whether you what the legal definitions are for particular circumstances i.e are you a dependent 
Have you been trafficked? If you're an overstayer, can you apply for asylum? They'll just regurgitate what are specific rules and not necessarily advise you if your circumstances make you eligible for anything in in particular. So again, if you're in a situation where it's not very straight, it's not straightforward, you may have to take specialist advice and I recommend that you do that. Don't guess. Um, again, with the rules on things like trafficking and claiming asylum, it's not so easy now just to write off and fill out an FLRO form, which was very common. Many people used to do that as a sort of um, catch-all situation, just fill out an FLRO. The forms now are very specific. Um, the FLRFP has been used to try and extend stay for children who are um, have spent seven years in the United Kingdom. But this year we've seen how that definition has been narrowed down. It's not simply that a child has spent seven years or was born in the United Kingdom. It's a case of can that child reintegrate when if returned to their home country. And again and again we've seen the judges interpret this very, very narrowly. So even if a child has spent seven years, you must show barriers, difficulty as to that child reintegrating if they return to their home country with their family members or on their own. It's expected that children who are here that have overstayed are going to be returned with their parents. Therefore, you have to show why in the best interests of that child it's going to be impossible for that child to overcome all the burdens, the hurdles they will face when returning home. And it's a very high threshold to meet. It's not simply they don't speak the language, they don't eat the food. It's a case of showing why they are going to have serious disruption or suffer serious harm or um, barriers to their development should they go back. So it mainly applies to children who are suffering with ill health, have um, specific diagnosis or have educational challenges such as autism or untreatable or conditions that will be very difficult to treat should they return home. And again, this must all be backed up with evidence. It's not just a case of saying it, you know. Even if the lawyer puts it forward in the most beautiful uh, submission, the judges are looking for evidence. So you need educational psychologist reports, social worker reports, country reports to back up the position that the child will suffer serious harm or have this certain barriers to reintegration should they be returned. It's It's been, as I say, a very, very busy year and really looking forward, there's going to be further restrictions on the right to appeal. Unfortunately, the government has made it very clear that where in cases such as automatic deportation cases, people who have criminal convictions may not be able to um, basically appeal in country. So they have a, a request for them to be automatically deported because they've had a sentence of 12 months or more. Then it means they face automatic deportation. It's the position that that deportation order can only be cancelled once the person has left the United Kingdom. So in all instances now, you can only challenge that initial removal from the United Kingdom if it's going to breach your human rights or if there has been an error in the law. And this same uh, principle is going to transpire to all immigration appeals. As it is already, some people have an in-country right of appeal and others have an out-of-country right of appeal. And the determining factor is, A, whether you have... Um, previously had an appeal, exhausted all your um, appeal rights and there are no barriers to removal, therefore you may not have any right of appeal at all. B, if you have made um, an immigration decision, you've not overstayed and the type of application you've made carries a right of appeal, it is going to, um, let me say, eight times out of ten now, be only exercisable from outside the UK. So you must, you must be very, very clear on whether the application you're making actually carries a right of appeal. From April next year, the regime is going to become very, very stringent, very harsh, and people need to be prepared for that. And if you feel that you cannot um, exercise your right of appeal from outside the UK, or if it's been determined that you've exhausted your right of appeal, then you have to immediately consider whether you're going to ask for a review of that decision to the upper tribunal, 
And if you are, you have to be weary of the costs implications. It is quite expensive. And at the upper tribunal now, they're becoming, um, they're doing what's called a naming and shaming. They've started that over the last two years where, so where a lawyer puts in frivolous grounds or where a lawyer puts in things that are not very strong and they are ba basically naming the lawyers and saying, well, this is not very good. This was quite rubbish. There's even been judgments where judges have sort of um, outlined that, you know, this advice is poor. This was doomed to fail. We're not sure why the lawyers have bothered really to come this far. And unfortunately, in situations like that, there are orders that the um, actual applicant pay the legal costs. And these can go into thousands of pounds. And they're actually even enforcing at times against people who are legally aided. So you really, really must take very detailed advice on whether your case is meritorious or not. Apart from the fact that you may have to apply to the upper tribunal for a review of the decision that doesn't give you a right of appeal or a review of a decision um, that means that you have to uh, appeal out of country, you may have to apply for an injunction to stop you from being removed from the United Kingdom. And again, the upper tribunal looks at these injunctions and they are very, very harsh in their determination of them. Should they feel that there is not going to be a breach of your human rights, even if you're caring for um, people, at times they make these decisions. So they may call social services to come and look at children, look after children, or another parent to come and look after children, even if you you have a child that is British you can be removed there have been orders made for the removal of people who've even been let me say spent over 30 years here most recently there have been people who've been released after prison sentences um, I think even one was a quite a popular case of a Ghanaian banker he spent all his life here he was in his 30s he'd been here uh, prior to the age of um, six but yet he was removed and that is after a number of appeals so the judges have been thrashing out the, 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 it's been a very interesting uh, year for lawyers on, on, on what number one the conviction they seem to have their presence in the UK not to even be conducive British. not to be conducive for the public because they're not British this is the thing if they've had their indefinite leave to remain and on that basis they've been determined as basically not being British and then because of the conviction it's been determined that their presence has not been conducive for the, you know to the public good and it's a it's a difficult argument to um, win if the conviction has been more than let's say three years it's I normally look at three years but the case law is very definitive most recently we were successful at the Court of Appeal in keeping somebody in the UK who had a conviction and family here but it just shows even if your children are British even if you have been here in the UK even if all of your family is British if you have the conviction the government will still pursue you relentlessly <laughs> and ask that you leave because they are under pressure to s narrow down the interpretation of the Human Rights Act and the right to private and family life but as I say we've been very successful at the Court of Appeal on decisions like this and um, the authorities are there for anybody to look at and um, it's it's um, a situation where the, the UK government is trying to say that if you have a conviction or you engage in criminal activity, then that very behaviour shows that you are not actually including yourself in um, uh, basically British society, British standards, and therefore you are not actually engaging in society here. And, then, and apart from that, the actual nature of the criminality means that your presence is not conducive to the public good. So they're trying to diminish the fact that you are engaging or exercising your treaty rights and trying to say that it's being severed if you are committing a actual criminal offence. So it's quite important that you take advice if you have convictions, even if you have children here and you've spent more than 20 years, even 30 years, and your sentence is more than 12 months, take advice. We've had examples of cases where people have up to 10 children, six children being removed, and those children being British, because it's all about showing that relationship, the evidence, the evidence is what is most important. Um, again, so we've spoken about the bad character, um, seven year rules, even if your relationship is broken down with an EA national, or even if your relationship is broken down with a British national, you, it's all about still showing if you have um, grounds to stay in the UK, what the extent of your private and family life is, your change of circumstance, even if it's there, 
the cases that have come up this year have been amazing on this and it's just showing a complete narrowing down of the rules making it much more difficult for people to say oh it's part of my um <laughs> private life it's right a part of my right to private and family life rather under article 8 um, the Article 3, as I've said, that's the right to be free from degrading treatment. The Home Office is pushing people to claim asylum quite instantly. So if you have overstayed, if you were brought into the country illegally, if you were brought into the country under duress or under the will of somebody else and you were coerced or been put under pressure to work, it means you have to try and make sure as you collate that evidence and recall your history and try to make an application under trafficking. And that's, we've mentioned that before, it's a two-stage application. So first of all, you report yourself to the Home Office and you're acknowledged as a trafficker. Normally that is done through a third party. So there are organisations that are outlined to do that. So Bernardo's and the Red Cross. So you have to actually try to get them to um, acknowledge you or refer you in. Even if you're not referred in by one of those agencies, you can be referred in by a lawyer, a crisis centre, a church. Once the application is made, then if you are acknowledged or accepted to be somebody who is trafficked, then there's a secondary level of application, or sorry, assessment that takes place. But during that whole process, you are supported. So even if it was some time ago that this happened and you have children, then what happens then is that you will be provided, offered support. And that support can be by way of housing, it might be by way of um, therapeutic intervention, clothing, and there are various, um, let's say, things that might be identified once your case is assessed. And if you have children, again, they may be assessed with regards to whether they need to have financial support, schooling. So don't let the fact that the um, let's say the incident happened some time ago or you failed to report it at the right time, stop you. There are procedures set down in place as to how victims of trafficking, slavery and domestic servitude must be treated and at times um, it, the assessment can take quite some time but during that time basically you are supported so don't feel afraid to step forward. Do you need legal advice? Do you need professional help at a reasonable cost? At Obasaki Solicitors, we have experts in property law, human rights, criminal litigation, immigration, civil litigation, family law, business law, landlord and tenant law, employment law, Sharia law. At Obasaki Solicitors, we can provide you with advice and assistance at all levels. We have over a hundred years experience in serving our local communities and we have a new maritime and international law department. We can help you. Book a free consultation today. Obasaki Solicitors, providing you with advice and assistance at all levels. It's been a very long uh, year and indeed, indeed. <laughs> and a long day. Uh, I, I will be asking what we should be looking at in 2016, but unfortunately, we haven't got the time to review that. But it, subsequently, in our next program, I uh, will take a look at 2016. Indeed. What does it hold for us? How well will this government be pushing for uh, cutting down on the level of migration in the United Kingdom? We'll be taking a look at that. Uh, in our subsequent program but what we'll be telling our viewers on this program is you didn't you do need to take legal advice in whatever circumstance and situation you find yourself your situation may not be might not be attractive or placed you will just require a good um, um solicitor uh, to review your paper take a look at your case and with some help with some support with some faith situation can turn out to be in your favor and however having reviewed every situation and and having them um, gone through all the basic appeal procedures and if things have actually gone not too good for you you probably might be looking at uh, assisted voluntary return uh, in your case rather than being forcefully removed it's been a very wonderful busy uh, year 2015. Thank you for being part of the program Voice. We, we would not have been here without you and so we appreciate your presence, your support, of course uh, your advice and keep, keep, keep the call and the text message coming in on the show. It's been a wonderful year. Do have a uh, beautiful festive season. Bye.
as part of our continued efforts to reach the African and other ethnic communities in the United Kingdom with greater impacts and create the platform to hear your silent and unheard views in this hugely green community in the United Kingdom, our channel, Ben TV, presents to you another live current affairs television program. Our focus on the program is to review and discuss issues around the diaspora community in the UK. The program offers you that unrestricted voice on issues affecting you in the UK. Join us live every Monday at 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Another business segment of Dialogue in Diaspora, 2 to 3 p.m. every Monday. But guess what? You know you can be part of the program. Just send us an email at bentelevisionuk at gmail.com. Dialogue in Diaspora, your voice, your opinion on our TV.